Folks, how are we doing? Great. Good. Great? Yeah. So, um, Dr. Miller, first of all, I want to thank him for having us here. So let's give a round of applause for Dr. Miller. And in addition to that, I just want to apologize to you guys. So I heard that you guys still had school during Hurricane Sandy. Right? How would how'd that go? Look at you doing homework by candlelight, right? All of you. That's pretty awesome. So props on that. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, my name is Keys, and I'm originally from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and currently I'm a full-time vol volunteer for Invisible Children. For those of you who don't know what Invisible Children is or what we do, um, essentially we're a nonprofit uh, that has the main mission to end uh, bring a permanent end to horrible atrocities being committed within Central Africa by a group known as the Lord's Resistance Army, which is led by a, a rebel leader named Joseph Kony. Um, so maybe you guys have, did you guys see Kony 2012? Yeah, so a good majority of you. Awesome, awesome. Uh, well, anyways, today I am joined by my teammates. Here I have Jono and Sammy right there, and then Richard, who's all the way in the back, and he's actually joining us here from all the way from northern Uganda. Um, so what we're here today to do is share with you our latest film, and it's called Move. We're so pumped for you guys to see it. It just came out a few weeks ago. Um, and then after the film, we're actually going to bring uh, my friend Richard back up here, and he's going to share with you about his experiences uh, growing up within the conflict region. And then following that, we'll have time for you guys to ask any questions that you might have. And then we're going to talk to you a little bit more about a huge event that we're com that's coming up on November 17th, with, which is next Saturday down in Washington, D.C. But anyways, before we can do any of that, we have to watch the film, right? Yeah. yeah. All right, guys, let's clap it up for the film. I'm going to get the lights. And then we'll start. There is a strange and significant thing that happens when a slinky is dropped. The bottom just hovers in midair until the impact from above forces it to move. From the first letting go, the bottom was always destined to follow. Coney 2012 was the start of an experiment about what our generation is capable of, and it's not over yet. How we finish will determine where international justice will fall from here. Whether you lead or you follow, eventually everyone will have to move. We are looking to meet the millennials. First of all, who or what is a millennial? They're really a different breed, Richard. They're members of the generation born after 1980, who came of age in the new millennium. Millennials embrace technology and tend to be confident and expressive. They have a fix makeup and my eyelashes. <laughs> Time for lunch. They're self-absorbed, they want it all, they want it all now. A generation too busy trying to get noticed on YouTube or Facebook or Twitter to actually accomplish anything of real lasting value. All you need to know is I'm lazy. That's why I'm not shooting in HD anymore. Millennials, you are entitled and lazy and just not fit to live. So, Jason, you've recovered. You're back at work. A lot of people have been asking, what happened? You are the first to receive this message because you are one of the first of 5,000 to sign up. <laughs> 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 I tried to look back. Oh. No! 
strength of Invisible Children is that we are a company that people cannot wrap their head around. You can't really mold us or put us in a box. Let's go for it! This is the story of a group of millennials from around the world trying to do something big to play our part in ending a war. For nine years, Invisible Children has been trying to prove that all life is valuable and equal by telling the story of how it hasn't been treated that way in Central and East Africa. We've done 14 tours and made 10 documentaries about Joseph Kony and the Lord's Resistance Army, or LRA, who have kidnapped children and forced them to fight as soldiers and what we can all do to bring it to an end. We have worked to bring this issue to the world's attention and build life-saving programs. We advocate, we care, we have the human connection, but it's now about the voice of the young people to stop the perpetrators from doing what they do around the world. This is Jolie. She is the true founder of Invisible Children, informing and guiding our programs in Central and East Africa. <laughs> this is Ben, our CEO. My butt hurts on this chair, but I'm soldiering on. Noelle, our social media mastermind. Get this. I've been filming. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> My name is Jason, and I'm the creative director. 2012. He gave me 20 pounds. And this is Jacob. Can you give me your best American impression? What? Uh, you, I know you can do it. Yes, you know, yeah, what's up? Why are you doing it? <laughs> Meeting Jacob nine years ago started it all. Jacob, what do you think? What's your dream? For me, I can see, like, since I am in you know? I should work on so that I see that my children are not under illusion. And when I met Jason, he got so much interested in knowing what was going on. For me, I was abducted when I was still young. I was abducted when I was only 12 years old. When I told him my story, he made a promise to me of trying to, like, stopping the war, which has been going on for, like, years. I was born when this war was going on. Joseph Kony has been the leader of the world's most brutal violent rebel group for 26 years. He is the first war criminal indicted by the International Criminal Court and was chosen first because of the perversity of his crimes and because he has mutilated and killed women and children by the tens of thousands. He has cut off people's ears. He has cut off people's lips. He has made children eat the flesh of a human being. That is what children have done. One child would tell you, I killed more than 200 people. That is how bad Joseph Kony is. You just cannot compare this to anything in the world. Kony's violence started in Uganda, but in 2006, the LRA moved out of Uganda into DR Congo, Central African Republic, and South Sudan. Jacob was lucky enough to escape, but many were abducted years ago and grew up in the ranks to become commanders. And others have been abducting for Kony since the beginning, like this man, Caesar Achellum, one of Kony's top commanders. We had some grassroots success and were working alongside incredible leaders in the region who had been fighting to stop Kony for decades. But despite our collective efforts, the violence of Joseph Kony and the LRA was allowed to continue. And because the world wasn't treating it like the emergency it was, we decided to change our tactics and go bigger. We were just so tired of it not clicking with the rest of the world and people not jumping out of their seats to solve this problem. It hit me really hard and I said, they don't get it. 2012 was just the year that we were all chips in committed to making sure the world knew about this man and the situation. I don't know how else to create it. Like, do you need to see another kid crying in order to do something? Or do you really just 
want to cut to the chase. This is exactly what we need you to do. Stop at nothing. Our generation could bring a warlord, the worst warlord in the world, to justice. If people know about Coney and know about the atrocities that he's committing and know about the children and the communities that are being affected, that they wouldn't be able to stand for it and they would do something. If you just report the facts and the statistics of a war, people can't relate. So they turn it off, they don't watch it. For Coney 2012, we decided to put myself and my son and our relationship with Jacob in the movie in hopes that it would bring the story home. Can you think of a good way to like try our best to stop them? We gotta make a plan. Let's make a plan. I remember clearly looking at our team who makes the films and I said, this has to be the best movie we've ever made. The title of the movie is Coney 2012. The title of the movie is Make It Famous. The title of the movie is Revolution. Make It 2012. Yeah, just keep it all the same. Coney 2012. All life matters, all life is equal. If you don't believe this, we can't help you. If you do believe this, then this is the year that we can prove it. This is about the plan to stop Joseph Cohen. That is a time sensitive. It's very time sensitive. This movie expires on December 31st. And if all of these things actually come together and like a domino effect, we can get them behind bars. Coney 2012 was very simple. Watch the movie, share the movie, put up posters and stickers, and to get as many people as possible to sign the pledge to arrest Joseph Cohen so that international governments would do more to actually stop the LRA. We're so excited to share uh, what we have planned for this next year. It's um, going to be the most intense and crazy experience we've ever gone through. There's other top leadership that's indicted, yeah. and any one of them that's captured and put on trial, it's our responsibility to make that trial so famous. Coney 2012, stop at nothing. Whether it's online, offline, no matter what, we are getting the posters up, we are getting people to talk about it, we will do whatever it takes. This is the grand finale. <laughs>
as the week when everything changed for bad guys around the world who could no longer hide. We should yeah. make this a moment where we say that everyone who gets indicted for genocide or war crimes or crimes against humanity, we're going to go after them and we're going to bring them to justice. Right. That would be a great right thing. He's a criminal. He's the worst kind of human being. I am so glad that this issue is taken up. Is social media at its best, isn't it? Is it possible that the most powerful army today is not military, but a collection of celebrities, students, and ordinary people trying to transform human rights around the globe? My cloud nine quickly dissolved. We didn't see the tsunami coming. We just turned around, and it, we were all underwater. The amount of traction we were getting, all of our systems that we currently had, were not going to sustain. Each one of these is a pledge signing up. Real to, time? Yeah, real time. Our website wasn't built to maintain 35,000 concurrent viewers at one time. So our website's crashing intermittently. The only thing we could communicate through was Tumblr. So, you know, you're not going to see all the information about every single thing that we do from a Tumblr. And that that was, I think, the beginning of the, the, the conversation turn from this was the greatest thing on the planet to what the hell is this? Well, I actually started to do some more research. It's not as simple as everyone thinks. Do you really think we're going to go into Africa, get rid of one warlord, and all of a sudden there's going to be utopia on the freaking continent? Feeling like these fabulous humanitarians for sharing a video on Facebook. I asked my mom, and my mom laughs and goes, he died like five years ago. It's the only one who am I going to believe now, man? Yeah. Are they telling us facts or fiction? Most importantly, is Invisible Children a scam? The conversation changed from Joseph Coney and the children who were victims of the war to who is this nonprofit? Who is this filmmaker? People thought we were getting rich off this. That is not true. People thought Joseph Coney was dead. That is not true. Some people even thought we were the propaganda arm of the government. That's absolutely not true. When you wake up and you find someone writing a coin to the trunk with a scam, they had already died a long time ago. I was offended because I cannot like wake up and start like telling lies about my brother being killed. Like, wh why should I do that? They abducted me and they killed my brother in my prison with the machine. We were at war with the world, basically. As an online campaign grew, <coughs> So did the voices of critics. People are seeing right through this propaganda very quickly. Manipulating the viewers' emotions. By next week, this will be a passing fad. People are saying that the millennial generation were just sharing their status or making it simple or they're just lazy. And is the rise of so-called clicktivism doing more to help or harm actual social change? This implies that by clicking um, on the link and forwarding something, you have done your share. If this is the future of activism, I'm, I'm really quite worried. I go and saw in the, the person keep asking those questions that make me look at him like, why can't you understand the wars to be stopped? Whatever it is, do you get what I mean? The questions that we were getting, not only was it questions about our organization, but it also was extremely personal, especially for Jason. They were not even criticizing the people children by then. I was seeing them criticizing Jason. And I'm like, oh my gosh. 20 interviews in LA, Red Eye in New York, five interviews in New York, Red Eye back. If you're put in the position to give answers to every question a dozen times over, your mind starts to lose track of where you are, if you've slept, who's for you, who's against you. After that, he came to the office and he was still in the Cody 2012 shirt. And that night he kind of shared about how he was having a hard time sleeping because mine was racing. And that was the first time that I got a glimpse that Jay was kind of processing this a little differently than us. There's never been a war like this online ever. And this is what you do to anyone who starts to get big. You go after them and you try to expose them. That's where my anxiety has been coming from. Total fear. Like fear is all in my head. Yeah. And, it's been, and it's been so gnarly. Again, man, it just, it's hard. I you know, just that. sound really different. Like something's up. I know. Maybe we need to go and sleep. I know. I, know. I can't sleep. Yeah. Oh, I, 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 I talked to Dan. I don't. Dan, well, I don't really hold on. Okay, I'm, I don't. I know you guys. I need to listen to you. Oh, no, I love you, man. You know that. I'm not. You 
experience something that's like out of control this weekend. Something that we've tasted, but we don't know what that's like. And it's not our face in the movie. And We're all about it. Okay, cool. We're praying about it. So awesome. Yeah. Trust me. We are. We love you. We know that you're in a crazy spot. And I know that you, you have no idea this is going to happen. I saw, but I didn't know what it would feel like. We told him, like, get some rest. You know, like, take a couple days, get some sleep, try to eat, recharge the batteries. We had that conversation, and he agreed. And then I didn't see him for three days. Breaking news tonight on one of the filmmakers behind Coney 2012. The man behind it has been picked up by police and taken to the hospital today. An official familiar with the case confirms that Jason Russell... People saw the man naked and screaming. The streets of San Diego yesterday... Jason Russell suffered from a psychotic breakdown. Yeah, and it appears it went downhill from there. Young there is strange twist. It wasn't just like losing the visionary, it was like losing your friend and you, your friends with his family and his sisters and his wife and his kids. And you started to be like, Is, are they going to lose their dad? And it's just like, oh my God. All I was thinking was like, they are like my family, I am part of their family. So I, I looked at him being like, what if he had not seen me? What if he had not met me? Would he still go through the same pain that he's going through right now? What if all this time is then, all these things we built are just done? I mean, it, I put on like a very like confident face, but I was I was afraid that somehow this was the beginning of the end. Of Dear friends of Invisible Children, this has been Kesey. Today and these last two weeks have been some of the hardest of our lives. And seeing what happened to my friend Jason today was so hard. Some of the personal attacks against him and his wife and his kids and family was hard for him. It really took a toll and That guy changed my life, and many other people too, many of you watching this, and that's who Jason is, okay? And this mission is bigger than him. We know that that's true. So I just want to say right now, for the rest of us here, we're not stopping. Please stand with us. Thank you so much for your support. It really means the world to us right now. Thank you. But uh, what is this? <laughs> when the guy behind the message has a total naked meltdown, yeah. does this help or hurt it? I would. I think it's safe to say it discredits <laughs> some of what was happening. Really? Yeah. People are really waking up and the thing has imploded. It turns out it's a total scam. Right after the Coin 2012, which brought the world to the same page that, oh, there's something which is happening in this region, and thousands are being abducted, kids are being forced into cell soldiers. Most of them turned the topic, talking about invisible children, talking about Jason. My biggest fear, and I think what happened as a result of Jason's breakdown, was it gave people such an easy excuse not to deal, not to have to deal with the reality of the LRA. And they just walked away and they brought a lot of friends with them. Getting involved with this war was never a choice for me. It was just something that I had to do. And it became very, very personal. For the last nine years, I've been working in this war zone with my friends trying to make sure that their voices are heard and that they're protected. My mind betrayed me.
and I was hospitalized. I'm so sorry to the thousands of people who were confused and who were scared and who didn't trust us anymore because of what happened. And I still live with that every day. The name of the campaign around Coney 2012 was Stop at Nothing. And we had to prove that that's possible. We're still proving that today, that we will move forward. We will still pursue the capture of Joseph Coney and his top commanders. They are children still in captivity. As long as we continue giving days and months and years to Joseph Coney, we should be prepared for the worst. There is need to stop him. And I'm grateful that we have the Coin 2012. There is more support than the strong objection we are talking about. The media is looking for news, the media always looks for negative news, that don't look for positive news. And for those who are condemning, how many of them come from the Cholisa region? How many of them went through thick and thin what we went through, what my children went through? To woke up the world. Because the world has a tendency of forgetting, moving from one thing to another. So it was a wake up call. It worked. It got people talking about an issue. We had academics giving a presentation on the LRA, then you know, 13 people would have watched it. I cover a lot of these conflicts, and the LRA is not a complicated one. There is this guy, Joseph Coney, who is going to continue to massacre people until he is captured. And then Jacob was invited to be the first ever person to testify about his personal experience with the LRA in front of the United States Senate. At the age of 12, I was abducted from my village by the Lord Registered Army. I'm calling upon the world to come up and join the youth who are advocating for the end of this war. All of this new international tension really culminated when the world woke up to the news that Caesar Achellum was captured by the Ugandan military. Major General Caesar Achellum, a senior commander in the elusive Lord's Resistance Army, but in the hands of the Ugandan forces. My coming out is a big impact for the people still remaining in the bush to be encouraged to come up. So that's when I made it the world country. Okay. Commander Achello may now be in custody, but LRA leader Joseph Coney remains at large. The hunt for him will go on. On September 1st of this year, the LRA reportedly abducted 55 people in one day. 14 were children. And right now, 470,000 people are displaced from their homes because of fear of LRA attacks. Some have said stopping Coney is impossible because no one knows where he is, but they are wrong. Information gathered from escaped LRA abductees and an early morning radio network have allowed us to track the movements of the LRA. This is not new information. The international community knows where Joseph Coney is. He and a small group of fighters have been moving freely within a region controlled by Sudan on the border of Central African Republic, where troops haven't been allowed to pursue him. He travels with dozens of abducted sex slaves, and he cycles through them at will. And his top commanders, roaming hundreds of miles away, are still killing and abducting in Central African Republic and DR Congo. <laughs> What did we do for those people to come to kill our brothers and sisters and kidnap so many children? We are working with the leaders in these countries to do our part to protect civilians and to encourage LRA members to come home through FM radio messages and defection flyers. There's no communication, there's totally no network. If there is a radio communication, it gives enough time to save lives. We were contacted by the UN 
who asked us to design flyers. As the LRA pass along these areas, they'll see the flyers, they'll see the messages that encourage them to stop fighting and come home. And it's working. Civilians are being protected and LRA members are returning home. But ultimately, we cannot arrest Kony. Only the leaders of the world can put pressure on him to surrender or arrest him. The African Union, the European Union, the UN, and the United States have all made promises to stop the LRA and protect civilians. President, for instance, something I agree with, he, he sent uh, uh, men and women to Central Africa to go and help battle Lord's Resistance Army. I, I support that. We are resolved and we are going to pursue Mr. Kony and still we open the door for him to surrender. And today I can announce that our advisors will continue their efforts to bring this madman to justice and to save lives. But sometimes leaders make promises and hope we forget. So we are all going to make sure that they don't. This is our plan. On November 17th, we need you in Washington, D.C. We are calling a global summit of the 10 international leaders who can activate the arrest of Joseph Kony. But you must get them there. If you do not show up and show you care, their seats will remain empty. Key countries in the world and every state in the U.S. have a minimum number of people needed to show up. That means every last person matters. Find out how many we need at Coney2012.com. We will descend on DC by bus, by car, by train, and by plane. And after the meeting, we will move. We will march by the thousands to the White House and rally on the 10 city blocks that surround it to let the newly elected president and leaders around the world know that our generation demands peace in Central Africa and justice for Joseph Kony. Our great-grandparents saw women fight for equality. Our grandparents stopped Adolf Hitler from taking over the world. And our parents fought for civil rights to declare us equal. We have been told that our generation will accomplish nothing of value. But the words of others will not define us. Only our actions will. We are fighting for a world where genocide and crimes against humanity cannot happen. The experiment is not over. We all have to make a decision. Either we lead or we follow, but eventually everyone will have to move. children back home in Uganda, um, I'm very excited to be here. It's a real honor to be talking to young people like you because every time I meet young people, I focus on the millions that are behind you. I tend to see the thousands of places you can be that I'll never be in. But the one thing I always ask myself is, how are you going to be remembered in all those places you're going to be to? What impact are you going to leave on the people that you're going to meet? The truth is, you're going to meet people. And uh, you are a leader wherever you are. Because there are some people who are willing to follow you when you begin to follow your dreams. And uh, to me, it's always a honor to be able to share with you. Um, you see, 
The first time uh, I met Invisible Children, it was in my classroom. It was high school and I was teaching. But at the same time, as I was teaching, I would work at the night commuter shelter where kids used to walk five miles, sometimes even more, to that shelter running for their very lives. And this was at the height of uh, abductions. And uh, I remember that shelter used to start operating at around 7 p.m. So I would uh, ride my bicycle to that shelter. But incidentally, some of the kids that I was teaching in class would also walk that same shelter for their safety. And you know, later on I learned that they are being sponsored into school by invisible children. But at that time, I was giving them more than just the academic work. I was giving them even the psychosocial support that is needed for them to be able to reach the next level. But you see, that was the first time I met invisible children. And later on, I heard that invisible children had a huge rally in the US in 2006, where young people your age had to spend a night in the cold in solidarity with those very children who had to walk those miles, those places of safety. I'm glad to announce to you that that very shelter I was working at in the night was closed in 2006. And uh, later on, as I continued teaching, I joined Miss Bochuri in 2007. But you see, when this war began, personally I was just five years. I was a very young boy. And uh, I remember using, usually we would run to the river. We would uh, enjoy being around the fireplace. Our village was a beautiful place to be here. But then, all of a sudden, we were told, you can no longer continue to live here. Because people were disappearing. People were dying. Children were being kidnapped. So my parents moved us to town, but even in town where we moved, it was very unsafe because we continued to see people die because of diseases. The conditions of living were not good. We moved further down south. I remember I studied down because I benefited from a scholarship as well. Um, somebody from the US paid for my school through an organization. I never got to meet that person. I believe I am because that person was. If that person was not, I wouldn't be where I am right now. But you see, when I returned home in 98, I was just shattered completely. Because I began to ask for some of my brothers, some of my cousins, my uncles and sisters, and they would say, Richard, that one was killed. Richard, that one was abducted. We don't know whether we will ever see that person again. I continued to live with those. It was a very hard time at that time. But you see, later on when I worked with Invisible Children, I began to see those kids. And you look them in the eyes, and you see a child who participated in killing his brother, who was forced to kill his brother. Some others were forced to burn down their village. And you see a child, they leave that village in flames. And this child feels like, I am the reason why our village is burning. But you know, when you continue to ask them, one time I interviewed one boy, and I told him, why did you continue to do all those terrible things while in captivity? And this boy looked me back in the eyes and he said, Sir, I'm a human being like you. I have a heart like yours. But when you are in captivity, you do not have any choice. You don't have any voice. Even crying alone is not allowed. Because if they ever get you crying, these guys would say you want to escape. They will torture you or kill you. 
So this boy told me the only friend that I had while in captivity was the very gun I was holding. And the same gun can even be used to kill him. So he would hide to cry. He would try to be somewhere. As the rain pours, he's in the jungles. When the sun shines, he's in the jungles. He wasn't even sure whether he's going to eat the next day. Such a place as called home was no longer there. You know? And the day he escaped, he was so excited. You know, one time when another one escaped from a massacre and he had to witness, you know, a barrier of like eight people of your family and you are having to count one, two, three, up to eight, he wished he had not escaped. I remember that boy saying, I wish I was also killed along with everyone. But you see, we can stand here and recount all these atrocities that have happened. We can sit here and continue to talk about all the things that have happened. In Uganda, as I speak to you right now, that thing is no more because the young people who stood way back then for us gave us a voice. And in Uganda, it's not there. But the people of Congo, Central African Republic, in the Sudan, that border region, they continue to cry. But unfortunately, their cries can only go as far as the people who are causing them that pain. You see, whenever two elephants fight, it is the grass that suffers. And these children, whenever you cry, it's only the rebel commanders who can hear your crying. And they don't care. They don't even want you to cry. They will throw babies into the rivers. But there's one thing we can do. We can give them a voice beyond those jungles. We can make them have a choice again by using our choices. You see, when they cry and the only voice has only gone that far, there is no way. There, is, there isn't any stopping on the horizon for their cry. But if we make them hard in the corridors of power, they will be able to make their own choices again. You see, when you look at what has gone on, many people tell me that this has gone on for so long, 26 years. We can't do so much. My reply is always, yes, you cannot do so much, but you can do something. Because change begins with something. It begins with realizing that when you plant a seed, it grows into a tree, and that tree grows into a forest. So when you realize that, you want to change the whole world as a young people. There is no change that begins on top. Never. Everything begins right here on the ground. Humble beginnings are the ones that usually round up as huge movements of change. I want to encourage you. There was a time when women could not vote. Somebody stood for them. They now vote. There was a time when somebody like me would not stand in front of you here. Somebody made it possible and we can be able to do it. We can choose, you and me, can choose this day to make that chain of love end with us or decide and say that chain of love does not end with me. I'm going to extend it. Sometimes it starts just across the street. That's how change begins. I believe when you put your hands together, you can always make a difference in this world. And it takes us standing up. When we see something wrong going on, we stand up. 
you don't want to be into the realization that those who do evil are the least among us. And we who know what is right, we are the majority. But have you realized that we are the silent majority? So we give way to those who are the minority evil to continue what they're doing. Because the majority we've chosen to be silent. We can rewrite history or we can study history. I don't know what you want to be. But I believe this day that when you use your voice and I use my voice, together we shall thunder and everyone will hear us across the world. Thank you so much for having us. Let me take this opportunity to welcome my sister and my friend Kiz. It's a honor always to take the stage with her. Please, let's give your hands and welcome Kiz. Yeah. Um, so, again, thank you so much for being here tonight. And I want you to know how fortunate you are to listen to someone like Richard speak. And he's definitely a true friend uh, to me. And it's been awesome riding around in a van across the country. Uh, with him over the past two months or so and uh, definitely learned a lot and had some good times but uh, we love being here uh, not only with each other but with all of you. Uh, anyways, so over the last 40 minutes or so we've kind of thrown a lot at you with the film and uh, with Richard and talking about his experiences but this is your time to uh, ask any questions that you might have and please consider this an absolutely open forum. We'd love to hear any questions that you have. We've heard it all uh, so feel free. Hands up, don't all shoot them up at once. Go. Any questions? All right, yep. Um, what made you um, want to help Tony in 2004? Awesome. Are, do you want to, from Richard's perspective or from mine? Either one. Either one. Okay. Um, yeah, so I actually uh, found out about Invisible Children back in 2006. Uh, when the global night commute happened, and I was actually a part of that in Philadelphia. So I got to sleep outside in the freezing cold, but it was awesome because there was thousands of people there. And that was when I was a senior in high school. And it really started to open my mind up about um, kind of what else is out there going on in the world. And um, over the past couple of years, I've been fortunate enough to do a lot of things pertaining to um, East Africa as well as South Africa. And it just really opened up my mind. and. I was actually a high school history teacher uh, for about a year before this, and then I decided uh, that you know being inside of four walls wasn't necessarily for for me right at this moment in time, and that you know I wanted to be a, a part of something that still had like education in it, but you know I got to reach more people and kind of do it for a great cause. So then um, one of my friends was was working for Invisible Children at the time, who is the uh, one of the lead graphic designers, and he's actually the kid. Um, who created this, uh, you know, with the elephant and the donkey coming together to form the dove. So that's pretty cool because he was a 22-year-old intern. But, um, yeah, so I just called him up and he said, you know what, you should apply and, you know, be a part of this. And so I said, all right, I did. And, and I ended up, and now here I am, and I've been working with Invisible Children since last January, uh, which has been incredible. And then for those of you who might be interested, we also, we offer internships in the fall, summer, and spring. Um, and you can apply for that. You have to be 18 or older, but yeah, it's a great organization to be a part of, and yeah, I just really love working for them because I, um, everything we do is centered around like empowering youth and showing that like all of us in here, we can make a difference. We do have the power of our voice to go off and do something huge. So that's why this is so cool. That's why Move DC is so cool because it's our generation coming together, and this will be something. I guarantee you it will be written about in history books 10 years from now. So, yeah, thanks for that question. That answered it. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, what's up? So, the whole thing is about 2012, but what are you guys planning to do past 2012? Awesome question. So, he's wondering what are we doing after 2012? Well, the reason why we created the campaign called Coney 2012, I want to remind you that we have been working on this for the past nine years. 
and that we created the campaign Coney 2012 is because, you know what, this is ridiculous. It's been going on for 26 years. It's time to bring this conflict to a permanent end, and that's why we wanted to put a date on it. Richard always likes to say, you know, I wish it was Coney now, so we could get him now, but we, you know, tried to give our, our world leaders about one year um, to figure this out. And um, so the question is, so what are we doing past, Coney, past 2012? Uh, we'd like to see Coney captured within this year. We have about a month and a half left. Um, but if he is not, then the main mission that we have is to bring this to a permanent end. So we're going to continue on. I don't know if it's going to be called Coney 2013, but again, we're, we're not going to stop. Um, the whole idea is stop at nothing, and we're not going to stop until we see a permanent end to this. Do I know the exact plans? No, but I know that we're going to make sure that this conflict comes to an end. Great question. Yeah. So, um, do you think it's possible that you will have by the end of 2012? Yeah, absolutely. Richard, you want to take this on, my friend? Um, I believe that uh, with you guys, we can do this together. You know, when we go down to DC and every leader comes from the Global Summit, all the puzzles are in place. But these leaders avoided us at the UN Assembly and they never shared about the same issue. So if they come together even one week, Connie can be captured because he is known where he is, except that the pursuing troops are not allowed permission to move around in the sovereign countries. So we believe that this summit can bring this message home. And even one week, I believe he can be captured if the leaders work together in the region. Thank you. Awesome question. And again, that's why it's so important. If you can come to Move DC, it's only a week and a half away, and we'd love to have you there because every person counts. And um, it'll definitely, it's going to be huge. And we can't wait for it to happen and hopefully find Coney and capture him. 2012. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, was there a lot of people showing up in Washington uh, on September? Yeah, so great question. You asked if there was a lot of people showing up in Washington on September for... You mean November? Yeah. Yeah, November 17th. Yeah. So um, that's still, it's a week and a half away. No, you got it. November 17th, it's next Saturday. Uh, what we need, we need 10,000 people to be there to make this absolutely huge. Right now, if you go on our website, Coney2012.com, you can see exactly the, uh, what the number is, but I believe it's right between 8,000 and 8,500. So we need about 2,000 more people um, to register, and I know there's a lot of people out there that are just still trying to figure out their um, ways to get down there, but it's going to be wonderful. And like we said, um, this conflict has been going on for the past 26 years. And that's why never has there been more of a time than now that people know about what is happening and what's going on um, within that region. And this is our chance to act. And that's why Move DC would be so huge. November 17th, so huge. So if you guys can make it, that would be tremendous. But other ways, if you're looking for other ways to get involved, you can also, right now, if we, when you go back to your dorms, which I think it's so cool that you guys have dorms, um, <laughs> when you go back there tonight, you know, hop online now that you have electricity back. Um, you can go to Coney2012.com and actually um, message some of the global leaders that we're still looking uh, to confirm uh, their presence. And uh, for the tri-state region, being New Jersey, we're looking, uh, we're kind of aimed at Joseph Kabila, who is the president of the Congo, to send one of his representatives there. So, and there's a couple other people you can message such as, we've heard back from six of the ten global leaders and there's four more left. So you guys can go back to your rooms and message them, but again, if you just have 30 seconds, you can message uh, Joseph Kabila from the Congo, which is really imperative. And then also, if you guys are looking um, to come to Move DC, you know, you wouldn't show up to game day without a uniform, right? So we have these Coney t-shirts, they're only $10 in the back, and then you also get a free Coney bracelet along with them. So if you want to be a part of it, and even if you can't make it, but just, you know, reminding other people maybe that can, uh, that can go down. Because like we said, every person counts, and it's so important to be there. Um, I know that a couple of you guys have more questions, and we'd love to take those in the back. We're going to be up there for the next, like, half hour or so, so we'd love to talk with you and answer more questions that you have.
Um, but before I leave, guys, we just want to leave you with this. This is a challenge for you. This is a challenge for our generation. I want you to think about what you thought in the film when they were talking about what a millennial is. And, you know, kind of where we don't care about much. We're too busy on Facebook. We're too busy making movies for YouTube. Um, you know, we're a little self-centered. But I want you to think about how that makes you feel. Is that really how you want this generation to be perceived 20 or 30 years from now? Or do you want to be able to look back on our generation and be like, you know what, we did something huge there. We came together. We used our voice. So, like I said, if you could be at Move DC, awesome. But you know what, if this isn't something that resonates with you, I totally understand that too. But I challenge you to go out there and find something that you're truly passionate about. And it's something that you care about, and I want you to do something. We can't always do everything, but we can do something. And it starts with each one of us individually. But again, thank you so much for having us. We love being here with you tonight, and we'd love to see you guys at the back. Um, but again, peace and love. Keep it real.